welcome to video number four in which I show you how to process the images that we just took as well as uh, do the actual image correlation. As a quick side note, if you do use an iPhone, um, your images are natively stored in a funny image uh, format. If you want to store them as JPEGs, which will be easier, you can go actually under settings, camera, formats, and then select most compatible, which will store your images in JPEG rather than uh, HEIF, I think, is the native format in which um, the iPhone will want to store it. You may want to set that back to its original setting or default setting after you're done with this project, but in the meantime, I think this would be advantageous. All right, um, I created two folders in the, um, my default folder here, one with the unprocessed images. So these are the images that I just transferred to my computer. You can look at them and you can see the speckle pattern quite clearly here. Um, I use the AirDrop because I'm working with a Mac and a phone, uh, sorry, iPhone, but I'm sure you have your own ways to transfer images from your phone to your computer. In the next step, I'm actually opening a software called Fiji which is uh, essentially a form of image J. This is a freeware you can download. If you just Google image J, you're gonna find very clear instructions for how to download it. And we're just gonna um, basically crop the images here. And this is the software I'm used to, so this is what I'm using. If you wanna crop it by hand or crop it in a different software, um, be my guest. As a first step, we're going to actually open um, the unprocessed images, well, one unprocessed image, and teach um, Fiji essentially how to crop these images. So to this end, we're gonna go on a plugins, macros, and actually record the couple of steps that we have to take for this. Specifically, while this is running, we're gonna use the rectangle selection tool, and we're gonna just outline this rectangle here. I suggest that um, you're pretty liberal with this because remember, as you deform your sample, it may extend. And then next we go under image and crop, and what we're left with is this. We actually don't really care about the specific image. What we cared about is these commands. So I'm gonna copy them. Um, I close this. I don't need to save this, but what I will want to do is actually a batch process. Now the images that I took, so undergo under batch and then macro. I ignore whatever's in here and instead paste in what I just recorded. Here I'm gonna select the um, input images. I'm gonna select the unprocessed images as the input, as well as the processed images as the output. And I click process, and we see a little process bar here. And once that is done, all of our images should have been cropped and stored in the folder called processed. We can go back real quick, take a look at this, and make sure that this is what we want. And in fact, this is exactly what I wanted, and you see, selecting um, that frame fairly liberally allowed us to actually include all the images that we wanted. Okay, so that was the first step. The next step is now to download the software called Encore. Um, I have provided a link for Encore in the original description for this project as well in the paper describing it. Um, you will not have a hard time finding it. The website is www.encore.com and download instructions will be available on that website. Once you've downloaded the program, you can start it. Um, this is a MATLAB code. You can press play and you will have this little GUI that will guide you through this process of digital image correlation. The first step is you click on file and load reference image. We're gonna actually go to our folder with the process image, and we're gonna select our reference image. You see, this is not a super fast process of loading, so it makes sense to crop these images. Here actually on the side, you see the program stage in which we now um, have a green light on the reference image. The next step is to select the current images. We do that. I go back for the processed images. You wanna make sure that you also include the reference image, okay? So I load all these images. You can see down here, we took a total of 14 images. Here you can sort of go through them and make sure that all the images are there. The next step is to define a region of interest. We click region of interest, set reference ROI or region of interest. We will draw a region of interest. Um, specifically, I will draw a rectangle. 
that I select somewhere in the center of my sample. Again, we want to select an area in which we're fairly confident that our sample will be homogeneous or the deformation state will be homogeneous. I'm happy with this selection. I'm not super happy about the sample somewhat being bent. Um, I guess I didn't mount it as symmetrically as I wanted to, but this is a real um, live demonstration. So we're gonna go with what I got, which is probably not entirely unlikely what you end up with. So we um, define this region of interest. We're gonna finish here. And the code tells us the next step is the DIC parameters. So under analysis, we're gonna do set DIC parameters. So here you see a resolution or a blow up of our DIC pattern. I've played around with this a little bit and I found that um, a subset spacing of seven works quite well um, and a subset radius of 55. If you want to learn more about the specific um, uh, reasons for why I set them or what they mean, there's a manual available for the software that is quite um, extensive and we'll be giving you more information. I'm not touching these different parameters here, but I will be enabling a step analysis for high strain analysis. But for it, I'm gonna use the seed propagation and the auto propagation options. I'm not gonna change that. I'm gonna click finish and I'm gonna confirm these options. Well, the next step is to perform the actual DIC analysis. So under analysis, I'm not now going to perform the DIC analysis. I'm gonna select the region for which I just click in the center of this. I'm gonna set a seed for which I also click in the center of this. I will finish this. And now we're processing these images. When I first started playing around with this code, I actually didn't crop my images and these steps would take a long, long time. Be my guest and try it out um, for your own education and to collect your own experience, you will find out um, that it's really better to invest a couple minutes in the beginning. So this is the first time that we will get a chance to um, observe to what extent the DIC tracking worked. Uh, here you have our seat um, and you can now monitor on the right hand side to what extent we were able to successfully track this particular, sorry, particular pattern. And you can see that we successfully tracked it. I'm going to finish this step, I'm going to finish this step. And now I'm going to let the DIC code actually do the processing on all my data. You see, it's going to take a little bit of time. We're now at image number two out of 14. So um, yeah, we're going to just take a quiet moment here and watch the code do its thing. Okay, we're back here. I uh, cut out the tedious part um, between image three or 14. Um, the DSC analysis is now completed successfully and we press okay to finish. And if we look at the list here, we see the DIC analysis is now green. The next step will be displacements. So under um, analysis, we can now format displacements. And this step essentially assigns a physical um, uh, dimensions to our currently dimensionless analysis. So when we click get unit conversion, we can now actually define a reference line uh, and give it a physical dimension. So to this end, we can load a calibration image. What this really means is that we're going to load a, um, a image of which we know the dimensions. It turns out that of course, when I made the sample, uh, I define the dimensions to be specifically 10 millimeters width, or in other ways, in other words, my dog bone sample has a width of 10 millimeters. So I can now set a line. What this means is I draw a line along the width. The sample is a little tilted, so I tilt my line as well. And I define this to be 10 millimeters. And now the code can actually define the length of a pixel, which happens to be here 25 micrometers. Um, all right, so with that being done, I can finish this now and I can apply this calibration to the actual um, image analysis. And now we actually have units. Turns out this is not super important when we only look at strains, but it's always good to um, do all the steps of this analysis. All right, we're processing all these images for this um, displacement analysis. And now the final step is to actually calculate strains. When we do this, um, we can set what kinds of strains we want to analyze. We have the options here between Lagrangian or Eulerian. Um, I'm choosing Lagrangian strains here. And yeah, all we need to do now is to actually click finish, confirm this option. Yet we go through another 14 images, but with them being done, we're actually done with this analysis. So strain calculations are complete, press okay. And so what we can finally do is look at our strains. 
So um, the main strains I'm interested in are the strains in longitudinal or length direction, or uh, if you will, in the y direction. If we do this, um, we see the following analysis here. Um, we can actually go through our 14 images and get the strain for each image we took. One of the things you may notice is that the background image doesn't change. Well, that's because we taken a Lagrangian look or do a Lagrangian analysis here. Um, also, you may notice that the strains seem pretty heterogeneous, but I want to um, actually highlight the fact that the strains here are on a dynamic scale. So each time you load a new strain, it adjusts the scale. I have to be honest with you, um, the code is a little buggy when it comes to setting these um, the scales. So um, it takes always a little bit of playing around, but um, if you want to kind of highlight um, the, the global scale of these strains, you want to go to the last image and kind of look at the maximum strains. They're around 0.5. You can see the variation among uh, or within this region is actually not that large. It's between 0.488 and 0.5. So um, what I found works is I go to image 2. I set the lower bound as something like minus 0.01 the upper bound is 0.5, and then I apply this to all. Unfortunately, we're getting an error here. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, it never quite seems to work for me, so great. Okay, we set this to 0.5. Set this 0.5, okay, and this to minus 0.01, and then apply to all. Okay, that worked. Um, so in your reference configuration, of course, you have zero strains. And then um, now on a global scale, you see that the strains are actually quite homogeneous throughout the sample, um, given the global um, sort of range of strains that we're looking at. And I just want to remind you all that uh, the reason we picked a region far away from the clamps and we use the dog bone sample is to kind of create a homogeneous strain um, um, zone or region in the center of the sample, which we actually achieved here. So what are you going to do with this information other than sort of, you know, for intellectual uh, curiosity? What I suggest you do is um, to then use it in step five to do the stress strain curve using this data is you look at actually the median strain for each image. So what I suggest you do is you either create an Excel um, file or you just write it down by hand. But for each image, you note the median strain across your region. So for the first image, that would be a strain of zero. For the second image, there would be a strain of 0 0.0122. For the third image, a strain of 0 0.0319, etc. And um, I will do this on the site in Excel or in MATLAB. And then in video number five, we're going to use this to combine it with our weights that we applied and then plot a stress strain curve. All right. With this, I've shown you how to process the images that we just took in video number three and to perform a digital image correlation using a software Encore, and how to extract the strains from these uh, images that we will then use in image number five. Sorry, video number five. All right, I appreciate it much, and um, I hope this was uh, pretty easy to follow. If not, send me an email, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, bye-bye.